The other thing as well, also in the present tense, it is done. We've seen that phrase before in the book of Revelation. And of course, something very similar to what Jesus says on the cross, it is finished. And most translations say it is done. But, while we saw the phrase it is done with the pouring out of the seventh bowl in chapter 16, this is actually in the plural in the Greek. They are done. Even though most translations have it is done, it's in the plural. They are done. Which kind of brings up the question, well, what's the they? Right? Well, what's the day that is done? Uh, is it the making of the new things? Is it the, the works or the events of the first earth are done? Um, you know, it, it's no wonder in a sense that this is put in the, uh, the, the singular because of the collective nature, right? Because all the things that we see, and especially in the context of the New Jerusalem, <coughs> it's done. God's plan of salvation, um, the striving, the struggle against that, they are done. In addition to God seated on the throne showing his control, there's a reminder of God being fully in control by his identification as the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Connecting this back to chapter 1, where it was the I'm the Alpha, Omega, the first and the last, but now, God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and the end. Using those two Greek letters, I'm the A to Z. The first letter, the last letter, and really everything else in between. God is the source and the completion. He started creation and he finished it. But in all of this, there is some promises. And the first is the promise of the water of life and drinking from the water of life. But the promise is to those who are thirsty. And so the one who truly wants what God has to offer will receive it. So we can, we can think of and, and probably uh, connected in here are passages like Isaiah 55, which talks about, which is a call for people to come and receive bread, but also water from God without cost, freely. Perhaps, too, we're also to think of the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, where Jesus says that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are blessed, because they will be filled. But also, we're probably meant to think of some things that John says in his Gospel about the living water given as a gift with the woman of Samaria in John chapter 4 uh, and his discussion of the living water in John chapter 7. God is going to fulfill the thirst and that what is present in this new Jerusalem, this new heavens, new earth, is things that bring life. But they are gifts. There is no charge for the water of life. Now certainly that doesn't mean there aren't conditions for being part of the heaven, new heavens and new earth but that it is offered freely. And that we could probably theologically extrapolate and say it is free because God has paid the cost for it through Jesus. Who are the thirsty? Who's going to participate in all of this? Well, it is those who conquer. The ones who conquer are the ones who will inherit this. Here too, and we'll see this in chapter 22 as well, we are continually drawn back 
to the beginning of this letter. And those letters in chapter 2 and chapter 3, which promise to the ones who overcome, to the ones who conquer, they would receive blessings from God, a new name, uh, a white stone, um, sitting with Jesus on his throne, being a pillar in the temple of God, eating of the hidden man. All of these things were promised to the ones who overcome, to the ones who conquer. But on the flip side, if you don't conquer, you won't get them. But especially important out of all this is God's presence. And so again and again throughout these first several verses, it's emphasized that in this new creation, God is going to be fully present. And identify those that are there as his children. And they belong to him. They are his. I guess we too could say, we are his, right? I mean, if you put Christ on, if you're a follower of Christ, this promise is for you as well. And for me as well. But, there are some people who are not going to miss out, that are going to miss out on this. And so John gives a list. A list of people who will not inherit. The cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, the murderers, the fornicators, the sorcerers, the, the idolaters, and all liars. I've heard of people, parents, who have used this passage when their children have lied to them. To say, look what happened. <laughs> Your place is, as a liar is in the lake of fire. Anybody have that? Do their parents do that to them? Good. I mean, that's not what they do. When you become parents, don't use that passage. Don't browbeat your children about lying and say, you're going to burn in hell because you lied, right? Uh, yes, in some ways that's true, but, um, you know, um, we need to be careful that we don't use this passage as a, as a club. But the other thing, looking at this list, Is this a, do you think this is a comprehensive list? Does this cover everything that is going to exclude somebody from the New Jerusalem? Then, then why just list these specifically? What, what is it about these that these are included where others might not be? Yeah, I think that's that's a very good point. I mean, because one of the things that we've been looking at throughout this is emphasizing that not only is this a warning about what's going to happen to the beast, to Babylon, it's also warning to those Christians who are being enticed by those things. And so these sins especially are the ones that are potentially pitfalls. And so we need to kind of keep these in the context of Revelation. Because we can probably come up with other types of sin uh, that would, would also lead to the lake of fire, but aren't mentioned here because of the specific situation. And so we think of the cowardly. Those who do not conquer. Those who do not remain committed when called upon to refuse the mark of the beast. And so, you know, that's what's, you know, they're, they're not standing up. They're not being brave. And so those people that act like that, they're not going to be in the heavenly Jerusalem. The faithless. Those that, that prove that they're not loyal. The people that aren't remaining faithful to God. The idea of polluted, again, is a ritualistic term. Maybe unclean might show up in your translation. But especially making us think of um, the laws in Leviticus that made people ritually unclean. Right? If you do substance, like you touch a dead body, you're unclean. Uh, you know, if you touch somebody who has leprosy, you're unclean. If you have leprosy, you're unclean. 
and all those things that ritually pollute someone. But think about some of the things that those early Christians would have been called upon to do. Participate in the trade guild meetings and feasts to the various gods. Right? They would have made them ritually unclean before God. Murderers. Well, now that one, what do we do with that? Right? Because it may refer to actual murder, in which case, you know, it's kind of hard to see Christians actually being encouraged to m actually murdering as Christians. Um, certainly, you know, possible. Right? We think of, you know, as we look through the storyline of Revelation, participation in the beast empire led to the murder of people that remained faithful, people that wouldn't take the mark, were killed, chapter 13. And so maybe it is because you participated in this, you too are murderers. And so we might be able to connect it that way, but it might also be like a spiritual murder. Think back to those early chapters, those, uh, those letters. People like the Jezebel that's warned about in Balaam. Well, they were kind of, they were leading people astray. And so in a sense, they were spiritual murderers. And so that, you know, maybe we're to understand, like, if, if not only you fall away, but you're encouraging other people to fall away as well. You're going to be held accountable for that. Uh, and we can find passages in, in the, the Old Testament, the New Testament, that talks about, you know, that if, if you don't remain faithful and you actually lead other people into sin, right, you suffer consequences of that as well. Fornicators are the sexually immoral. Again, we've talked about this before, um, probably in a spiritual sense. Although, right, we could understand physical uh, impurity, physical fornication being included here as well, but again, think of it in a spiritual way. Uh, those that come to uh, sorcery, right, magic, that doesn't mean if you read Harry Potter you're going to hell, as some people would say. I don't think that's what, what it's saying. But, you know, people at various times have turned to other powers to try and gain control, right? Gain power for themselves. And so I think that's what it's talking about, is Christians who have turned to the, the gods of Rome, like the pagan gods, or even sorcery itself, instead of the power of the Holy Spirit that they should have been turning to the Holy Spirit for uh, guidance, for power, but they turned to sorcery. Idolaters, I think that probably makes uh, pretty good sense. But then liars. Liars, too. We could certainly think of um, you know, telling lies is a, a sinful thing anyway. But in the context of looking at these as specific sins that these Christians were uh, tempted to or seduced by, we think of, maybe we should think of Jesus' comments in John chapter 8 where he identifies Satan as the father of lies. Right? And so if you live a life of lying, you've cast your lot with Satan. Right? You've cast your lot with the dragon. And so I think we should understand this list of sins not as a comprehensive list, but as sins that were specifically to them potential problems. But in some sense, they're perpetual problems. Right? That, that even us today could fall into similar types of traps with our relationship with Jesus and our interaction with the outside world. But what ultimately remained, remained is the lake that burns with fire and sulfur if you live that kind of lifestyle. I mean, here's one of those moments. In the storyline of Revelation, the dead have already been thrown into the lake of fire. But this is a reminder of, right, you that are reading this, for whom this is in the future, this is still a potential problem. This is a warning. Don't end up in the lake of fire. And so don't end up in the lake of fire by avoiding those sins. Because that lake of fire is the second death. Right? The eternal death. The death beyond physical death. The death that lasts. That, that right there, uh, it seems like a um, person in this hell that they're going to be somehow aware 
of where they are. Could we say that this, this effect that we're talking about is the absence of God eternally, which is the source of all life? You know, the, one of the things that becomes difficult in talking about what awaits us is having to use symbols. And so the question becomes, is hell a place of perpetual fire, or is fire used to symbolize the torture, some of which is being separated from God? Yes, and it's certainly what we're expected to understand is, number one, whatever it is, you don't want to be there. Right. <laughs> right? And number two, it is a conscious type of thing. Right? That there is that awareness. Right? The beast and the false prophet are thrown alive into the lake of fire. Um, so, and, and I think certainly at least part of the torture of it is being separated from God. It makes me think of like Matthew chapter 5, towards the end of Matthew chapter 5, where, um, where Jesus says about um, God sends the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. He sends the rain on the just and the unjust. And I think about some of the passages in Acts where, where Paul is speaking to Gentiles and he's, he's using kind of uh, the ideas about, instead of the Old Testament, he's using ideas about God being present in all good things. And, and the language like that, right? God is the creator, God is the creator of all good things. And I think part of that torment is that without the presence of God, you don't get to experience those good things. Right? And so you can live this life totally rebelling against God or totally ignorant against God, yet still be blessed by God in a sense because he provides us with good things. about the things that that make you feel good. You know, you just like, man, you know, um, good food, good relationships, a good movie, a beautiful sunset. All that stuff comes from God, directly or indirectly. But without God's presence, you know, um, that stuff isn't going to exist. Um, you know, I mean... But that idea of, of the fire being present is also one that is consistently there throughout. So, so it seems like there will be some physical torment as well as the psychological torment of it as well. Um, but ultimately, again, you know, if you don't believe that it's necessarily going to be a quote-unquote literal fire, we can still be friends, we can still be brothers, because we both know we don't want to end up there. Right? And, so, and we, we want as many people as possible not to go there. No, no, I'm just saying, but there are some people that do. Uh, I, again, I disagree with them, but I don't think it's the point of a salvation issue. As long as we agree, it is not a good place. Nobody wants to go there. It is, you know, it's, it's not going to be like a, you know, you're on vacation and have no responsibilities and this God's not there. It's going to be torment. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be hell. Right? Um, and that's why we, you know, why it's become a, a curse word is because of what's reflected in Scripture about what that place is going to be like. And, and ultimately, it, by referring to it as the second death, right, it's something that's devoid of what we think of as life. Other questions or comments? 